thanks for for hanging out with me for a little bit. Uh, I'm looking forward to to talking a little bit about a topic that I've thought about most of my career in one way or another, um, and and spent a lot of time trying to explore and and get better at uh, for I guess going on 20 years now. Um, and that's the idea of building software and doing it in, in what I would call a sustainable way. Uh, and I'll try to describe what I mean by sustainably building software here in a bit. Uh, but first, I want to give a little bit of a background because I think it colors some of the things I'm going to talk about and describe here a, a little bit later. So I, I've come from this idea of client services for, for most of my career, whether that's um, with product companies or uh, enterprises or or other otherwise, and it's been a a really cool experience because I've had a chance to learn about uh, a lot of different industries and businesses, uh, learn to navigate a lot of different cultures, um, personalities, and that's neat because it gives you a lot of different perspectives when you when you kind of go from experience to experience, and uh, it also challenges a lot of the ways that you think things can happen. So what might work on, on one specific scenario, you bring it to another thinking, hey, this is going to work out really well. And it turns out that, that they don't always apply in the same way. And so you have to be pretty nimble. You have to have, I guess, what you might call like strong opinions, but loosely held or, or weakly held. And so you need to be able to adjust your approach to things. And over time, that's given me I guess a lot of different uh, tools or techniques in my toolbox that I can kind of pull out or or give a try on on different projects. And I think the one thing that has tied all of these experiences together is that the folks that I I've had a chance to to work with and the projects that I've been a part of and all of these experiences, they all involve these makers, these creators, the people putting time and energy into to building something. And I don't think this is unique to software by any stretch of the imagination, but I think for for makers, people who are building things, there's, there's no better feeling than seeing something that you've made out there in the wild and getting used. And so I've, I've spent a lot of my time trying to recreate that scenario. Um, and so when I talk about this idea of sustainable software. I'm, I'm talking about a way of building software. Um, I'm talking about an experience of building software that kind of meets three things for me. So the first is I want to be able to feel like I have confidence in my efforts. I want to I want to know that the work and time and, and energy that I'm putting into something that my teams are putting into something and things along that line are having an impact, that they're moving us forward. We're going to get to that point where I can see the thing that we are making out in the wild and getting used. And I want to feel like I'm in control and I want to feel like the people that are around me are in control of the process. I don't want to be feeling like the process is driving me. I want to feel like the process is something that we as a team can use to our advantage, right? Um, and I want to be able to do that over and over again. I want to be able to do that over the course of a project. I want to be able to do that over from project to project because I want to see the things that we make, that the things that we put time and effort in to get uh, get out there and, and see it used because it's a fun, it's an awesome experience. And that's so that's what I'm seeking. And when, when I'm talking about sustainable software, those are the types of things that I'm looking to achieve. But there's, there's a little bit of what I might call a, a dichotomy, maybe a conflict, if you will, between this and and some other things that we know to be true about building software and and about engaging in, in the process of building software and that's that's this idea that we know more tomorrow than we do today this is this is a line that we repeat pretty often to ourselves it, it drives a lot of the way we work the fact that as we engage as we learn more about what we're doing we're going to figure out new ways and new approaches to software and to the, the problems at hand and we need to be able to to lean into this idea that that we don't have all the answers today. We may f- feel pretty confident. And we want to build on that confidence. We want to build on what we know, but we want to make sure that we're leaving room to learn as we go along. And so the question becomes how do you how do you balance these two things? How do you balance this idea that we need to be able to learn as we move along? We need to be able to grow. We're not going to be able to predict everything. We're not going to be able uh, to tell everyone that we we know exactly what we're going to be doing in 6, 12, 18 months from now. Uh, it's it's very challenging to do those types of things it, at the depth necessary t- to have a detailed plan. But also 
feel confident in the way we're working, in the direction that we're going, feel in control of the process and be able to build consistently. How do we balance these two things? And I don't, I don't actually think that we need to. I think we, we can do these things together. We can do these things at the same time. And that's what we're gonna talk about here today. So for Sparkbox, that starts with a lot of times, I guess I should say, that starts with this idea of discovery. And this isn't uncommon for a lot of folks. It's just the thing that the way that we call it. Uh, but usually that involves research. So we're learning about uh, folks. We're learning about what they want to accomplish and achieve. And then we may, you know, once we've done some of that work with them, we might get together with them uh, either physically in person or like right now, we'll do those types of things digitally and we'll have a, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it and we'll, we'll go through some exercises. We may even try to narrow in on, on what we've understood and, and share what we've understood. Um, you know, out of all of that effort, we'll, we'll usually come up with documentation, what have you. Uh, that could be a project brief, which outlines some of the things we've heard, some of the goals that we've heard them say, um, a technical strategy, uh, design and experience strategy, things that they can take with them to, and, and will help us all try to make sure that we have this clear, cohesive vision together. Uh, but you know, if we do, and if, and when we do start building a thing together with our, with our clients, we know that that's not going to stop that learning, those discussions, that clarification is never really going to stop. Right. And that's where this idea of continuous discovery comes into play. And I'm, there's a lot to that. There's a lot of folks involved. It's not just clearly not just developers, right? Um, there are all sorts, if we took a poll of all of the different roles that, that are represented on this conference here today, if you wanna drop that in the chat or um, you know, in, a, in Twitter and, and mention, I'm sure there, there are dozens of different types of skills and roles and titles represented out there that are necessary to build software. But I wanna focus really on two while we're talking today, and that's specifically the planning and the building part uh, from a technical perspective, right? Uh, and so this is this is only a small part. I get it, uh, but it's it's the one that I I, I spend a lot of time in my, my own career uh, thinking about and understanding. And it's one of the ones that here at Sparkbox we've we've spent a lot of time trying to make sure that we do pretty well. Technical planning and building of software is informed by a lot of folks, but we at Sparkbox, and I think this is probably some true to some degree or another at, at most spaces is that it's it's kind of owned by a specific person or a role and the role that we ask to think about some of this stuff is a tech lead at sparkbox i want to focus in on on two specific areas that our tech leads are thinking about and that's Describing technical vision, so making sure folks understand it, right? Uh, and, and we described a little bit of that with our idea of a technical strategy early. And then the idea of empowering and unlocking the team. And they do that with a couple of skills that we, we look to, to curate or, or look for in our tech leads. So describing the technical vision and empowering and unlocking our teams. So how can a tech lead help to support sustainable software? Well, the first is they're they're going to be sharing, creating a shared technical vision, right? Uh, and making sure that the team has it. A lot of times folks are involved in the discovery. Sometimes this is pretty simple. Sometimes this can get pretty complex. It depends on what we're building, right? And what we're trying to solve for folks. Um, they're going to get involved in planning quite a bit, actually. Uh, they're going to be involved in in how we build software and the building portion of it. We'll talk about what that looks like. They're, they're looking to create a feedback system in the process, in the software itself, so that we understand if we're achieving our goals, right? This is the ability to learn, to be able to do things consistently. And then of course, they're gonna be looking at how we're building software, technical strategies that we're taking and knowing that there's gonna be an evolution to that, right? It's, we're not going to build uh, we're not necessarily uh, going to build software in the short term the way that it may need to be in the long term. There's going to be some evolution over time. I mentioned that we, we want to foster or create this, this shared technical vision on the team. And so we, we have to have one, right? Uh, and so that's an important thing. And what, what does a technical vision or what does a technical strategy look like? Uh, or at least how can we, how can we communicate it? Uh, most teams have a technical strategy or a technical vision. Uh, the question is, is do folks understand what it looks like? Um, maybe you've chosen 
uh, a framework, maybe you've chosen some technologies to use, and you've discussed how those things are going to come together. Um, and a couple of people usually know it pretty well. Maybe it's the folks that have been on your projects or, or at your company for a long time. The question is, does, does everybody on the team understand it? And it's important for everybody to understand it uh, for a couple of reasons, but which we'll get to in a little bit. But first, let's talk about how we can explain it, how we can describe it. So uh, at Sparkbox, that might just be something simple like, like a diagram or, or a document, right? You can communicate your architecture in a lot of different ways. And there's there's a good chance that you have uh, a technical vision that you're already trying to share with folks, but you may be doing it by, by word of mouth. Uh, folks may be discovering it as they work on the product. Uh, maybe if they're, if they're new to the, the code base or new to the system and they're, they're learning it, they're discovering it through the way it's set up. Um, doing some of these things in, in written form can be really helpful. They are easy to share, easy for folks to onboard, uh, easy for folks to go back to and read and clarify over time and remind themselves. Even, even you as a tech lead sometimes need to go back and remind yourself of why we made decisions. So one of the first thing that I think is, has been one of the most useful is to, to describe maybe a high level architecture. And this doesn't have to be complicated. A couple of points describing why you uh, decided to use different portions of the system or why you've created different layers to a system, uh, components, if you will. Uh, we can describe those pretty simply as a couple of bullets and maybe a quick quick diagram or quick drawing. Uh, sometimes this can be done just on a, on a whiteboard if you want, or uh, it doesn't have to be quite so formal. Uh, you might want to describe things like software patterns that, that you're going to use or well-known architecture patterns that you'd like different parts of your system to use. You might describe limitations or what you don't want to happen in certain areas. This helps make people decide where to implement certain pieces of functionality over time. You might describe how different components or different systems might integrate together. You might describe what that looks like in the long term or where you want to go in the long term, as well as what you want to do in the short term. If you want to make some maybe some compromises in the short term to achieve certain goals. Uh, one of the most useful things that I think uh, you can provide and I found that conveys kind of a shared understanding of how a system is being put together is to use things like diagrams, right? Um, these don't have to be, you know, any formal diagramming technique, uh, but just showing visuals and how things are going to communicate back and forth. Uh, you may even give examples of data that look, is going to go back and forth and, and endpoints that you might imagine happening if this is a, a web-based experience, a web-based platform. Uh, we're using APIs and how data is going to go between systems. This can really give quickly an understanding of, of the high level or the overall integration of all these different pieces so that folks, when they have this technical vision, when they understand where your team wants to go, where, where your technical vision is going, they're able to make decisions on their own, right? And so having this shared, this this understanding, this confident understanding about where you're going that is shared amongst your whole team allows individual team members to make informed decisions, right? And folks like tech leads don't have to be constantly babysitting the software architecture. We can be creating new leaders. Our tech leads can be creating new leaders, which is one of the most important things any leader can do. Now that we've got this, uh, presumably, this shared understanding of our architecture, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about how we bring that vision to life. Software can be a little complex, as we all know. Uh, it can take time, right? We're, we're not going to build things overnight, usually. And so we, we need to have an approach for how we're going to deliver these things. I would say that probably the vast majority of organizations out there are doing something that they might call agile or aligns with agile it, it doesn't really matter what it looks like for you um you know I, I, I at the end of the day we know that there is going to be some time put into preparing our teams to build some things and and building some things uh, for sparkbox we like to be pretty explicit about how we work um, we find that that it's easy to communicate to our clients it's easy for us to 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 get a cadence going, I guess, if you will. And that cadence allows us to build up some momentum on our teams. And that's really what we're looking for. We're looking to build momentum and, and try to gain uh, some speed and some continuity in our projects. 
In order to do that, in order to do that, we're going to have to get together and decide which parts of our system are we going to build. Uh, we do have usually the idea of a planning meeting as a part of our cadence that we put together. Um, you know, for you, if, if you decide to do these at, a, at different intervals, that's fine. Uh, but to get into those, to get into these idea of planning meetings, to get together and really talk about it and do it effectively, someone at some point needs to do some pre-work. And there's some things that we, we do in this and that our, our tech lead is the one who, from a technical perspective, is in charge of uh, or responsible for making sure that we're prepared for these planning meetings. It doesn't necessarily mean they need to do all of the things, but we're asking them to make sure that the pre-work happens so that we can get into these planning meetings and they're productive. So what kind of things do we want to get ready for our, our planning meeting? What kind of things do we need to prepare for our planning meetings? Well. Uh, the first is how we're going to implement or what we're going to change about the vision, what we're going to implement. What's the next stage of the vision? Are we building out APIs? Um, are we going to take a slice through the architecture? Um, are we going to prototype the front end? What part of that shared architectural vision are we going to start to, to deliver and build on? Once we understand that and once we understand what's valuable, we may put things together like scenarios, diagrams, uh, what we will call decomps, and I'll show you an example of those. But that's the idea. We want to understand what is the next stage of the vision. What are we going to try to put together? Uh, those can show up as, again, just some background uh, and then some resources. Okay, And those resources can link out to your diagrams from earlier. They can link out to uh, wireframes that other folks on the team have put together to describe what portions of the front end are going to come together. They may link out to some designs that have been put together. So there's a lot of work that's going into getting to the planning and doing planning effectively. But at the end of the day, we want to describe what is it we're going to start to put together here? What part of the architecture are we going to use? What parts are we not going to work on this time? So that's important as well so that folks know where we're spending our energy. The scenarios that we might describe, this this can be really helpful when you're trying to uh, to build out an experience that folks um, that, that there is going to be a little more complex, I guess, uh, and might get broken up into pieces and parts. So here you're looking at a scenario. Some people might call these use cases. Um, I think they're, they're not meant to be very formal. Uh, they can be. But here you can see like the different steps in maybe a process that someone's going to run through. And what we've got here are very clear kind of expectations, but also we're linking out to other issues, right? Other other work that we've created, other cards or whatever you want to call them. And that what that allows us to do is build individual pieces, but understand how they compose together, right? So this might be building out parts of the UI. This might be building out uh, different steps in the process uh, that we can then once we're all, once they're all built, they're they're coming together, and we have an understanding. So this is this is the larger uh, part of the vision that we're going to build, and the, then it's going to be broken down into smaller pieces. We can describe some of that here in a minute. In some cases, uh, one of the more more useful again, uh, this this fits my brain really well, uh, is using diagrams. Uh, this. When you have multiple teams coming together, working in different parts of a platform, uh, parts of a, a piece of software, maybe you have uh, a web front end with some APIs, what you need to do is find a way for each to work sometimes independently and safely build and integrate together, okay? So we want uh, a lot of times for, in this particular example, the, the, the e-commerce experience there on the front end and maybe some order management system uh, or set of APIs that's gonna start to accept new information that wasn't there before. And so what we're doing is we're calling out some changes that are being made to a system and how it's gonna integrate. But we all know now what that data payload looks like. So the each of the parts of this, uh, each individual or each parts of these teams can work together effectively and understand what are the contracts? How are we going to, how are we going to communicate together? And this diagram provides some of that. I mentioned, you know, when we're, one of the things we like to do off, uh, or find useful coming into planning meetings is to have taken maybe a front end experience that we're going to build and kind of tear that down into its component parts. Um, here I've just gone ahead and, and taken our, our website, the C, uh, C Sparkbox uh, Foundry, and I've started to decompose it into its parts here so that maybe we can spend a little bit of time talking about what featured content looks like up there on the top versus a category space or a content card down below. And 
while our next stage vision might be to build out this page, we can allow individuals as a part of this uh, next bit of work to go and work on individual pieces. Maybe the featured content is being worked on by, by one person or a pair of individuals, while the, the category space or the content card is worked on by someone else. Those folks can do those things. We can bring them together uh, and, and find a way to be building productively on our team and coming together and knowing how those things will integrate. We have an understanding of what uh, what those things look like, how they might integrate. Uh, if one person is working on a category space while one group uh, of folks is working on that content card, they can, they can have a, a shared understanding of where are the lines between their two pieces, their, their two bits of work, where are those drawn? So we've talked about some of the different types of techniques or some of the different assets you might build. Uh, for or prepare, I should say, so that you can come into these planning meetings and be productive. If you were to come in with all those and expect to build all, and create all of that type of thing in maybe a planning a, a session with your team, that's going to be a lot of time. And having five, six people, maybe you know a couple of different teams trying to do that all at once, it can be really chaotic. So having some of this prep work is important so that we can get into these planning meetings and be really productive. This is where some of this information can come out. We can prepare that and we can walk through what our plan is. Um, we may as a team start to look at the cards that have already been created, but it's not uncommon for us to uh, see that teams are gonna create cards together. Um, that, that is kind of a choice that uh, you'll find different teams like that differently. You might discuss some questions uh, you, as a tech lead or and, and the team that you're working with to prepare things. Uh, that, you know, maybe this is an individual on your team that's owning a, a specific part of the vision and they describe and walk through the plan and some questions come up on how that might actually work and, and some challenges that might come up. Some clarifying, some understanding that maybe it wasn't clear, uh, but at least we have uh, we've started, we've created a, start, a focal point through some of these things that we've prepared Having consistent, disciplined, thoughtful planning provides our team this, this confidence in what they're going to get into over the next couple of days, maybe a couple, uh, couple of weeks, depending on, on how long, how much work this is preparing for our team. It enables them to make decisions during that time and so they can get into building it out or, and, or your team can get into building things out and doing it with confidence, heading in the direction, evolving your architecture, building out the features that, that you're expecting. While your team is getting in together and building, our tech lead is probably starting to think about the next bit of work and what they're gonna be preparing. Uh, but while our team is building these things out, what our tech lead is focused on, what our, what, what our team is focused on, is gradually building confidence that what we planned is actually heading towards what we want to, right? Uh, so we've made these plans. Uh, they're now starting to face reality. Uh, we're starting to put uh, code uh, together and connect things together. And we want to validate some of the assumptions we made. We do that by, by integrating often. So we, we had some folks working on uh, the, the category content component that we decomposed, the decomp that we created. We also have some other folks maybe working on that content card or that uh, little piece of uh, content or the, the featured content area. And we want to say, hey, do those fit together? Does the CSS work together? Does the markup that we anticipate work together? Does this work with the data structure that we have coming out of our content management system? Do uh, the two systems that we expected to communicate data back and forth really work well the way we anticipate it? We want to do those types of things and we want to build out a test suite to make sure that the value stream that we're talking about, the important parts of the system, maybe that's buying something or checking out, or it's maybe it's reserving a book, or uh, it could be um, it could be any sort of, of outcome that somebody's going to get while using your software. We want to make sure that's still working. So we're evolving the test suite, building out the, the appropriate test suite. These are some of the things that our tech lead is making sure that our team has because these are the things that are going to build confidence that every step along the way we're heading in the right direction. And of course, we want to create the heartbeat of our team by deploying often, right? Getting things into the hands of important of people who understand what this thing is supposed to be at the end of the day. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to be production, but it, this idea of a build and a robust build and deploy pipeline is going to encourage the collaboration that we're looking for if we have 
if we have pull requests or changes that are being proposed, deploying automatically, the folks that are building it can talk with user experience, they can talk with design, they can show it to clients or you potentially even show it to users and see, hey, is this is this change that I'm this this thing that I'm implementing that I think I understand is it heading in the right direction? And that provides an immense amount of transparency uh, around the process. We don't have long periods of time where feature branches are out there being um, presumed to be built right, and a lot of sunk costs going into those. We can figure out really early and really often whether or not they're headed in the right direction. We can even have two teams that are building have their systems, maybe the, the individuals are connecting the front end to the back end, even on pull requests if they're deployed or on pre-production versions of these things that are deployed all the time. Being able to, to see our, our, our work deployed often provides us opportunities to integrate and build a cadence together that, that, and this momentum that we wouldn't otherwise be able to, to create if we were working in isolation and only deploying maybe uh, you know, once a week or, or, or less. Now, of course, all of this requires skill, right? Um, the idea of, of building software confidently, being able to build quickly and deliver quickly requires some engineering skill, all right? We want to be able to keep things like master or whatever our main line is deployable all the time, okay? And there's small evolutions that that go into everything we build. Every time we build our software, we're making changes to it. We might use techniques like feature flags um, or making feature enablement, only showing certain pieces of functionality when that feature is enabled or when certain data comes from another system. We might provide unpublished URLs so that we can keep deploying often. Uh, we need to be looking out and our, our tech leads are, are leaning on software design patterns, uh, architecture patterns, well-known software design and architecture patterns to create seams in our system so that individuals can work on the same area of our code. And we'll talk about how we recognize areas in our code that need architectural seams here in a bit. In order to build confidently, even in from day to day and week to week, we need to have this clear shared vision that everyone understands, that everybody can focus on and deliver against so that they're not uh, heading in different directions and building based on false assumptions. The pipeline allows us to understand if what we're building is working the way we expected. And then technical skill allows us to evolve our architecture, allows us to make changes to our system uh, that are, are going to work over time. They're gonna last over time. So now that we've started to feel confident that, that our team is building the right things, that they're building those things well because we've put uh, some time into explaining where we're headed and we've started to put things together and deploy them and we're seeing them work really well together. It's time to start asking ourselves, do we really understand how the system is doing? Uh, some of the more common ones, certainly understanding value stream metrics. Are people using the software the way you anticipated? Are they successful in using it? There's lots of tools out there to use uh, for that. Mixpanel, Google Analytics, uh, what have you. They're, they're all over the place. Um, understanding whether or not the system is healthy. Is it performing uh, in a healthy way? Are we are we uh, achieving you know the the speed or performance? Uh, you know, is the infrastructure that we've deployed going to handle what we've tried to build. Uh, this is an example of New Relic. There are many products out there that are great to do that. We just happen to be a fan of, of New Relic. Um, you know, are, are people having problems with the software? Knowing that and being able to understand that over time, did a deployment that we recently made introduce some challenges? Do we see an uptick in certain errors? This is an, uh, an example of Rollbar. It's just one of many tools that you can use out there to understand how how healthy or, or if folks are successful or having trouble with, with our system. And those are all important. They're all pretty common. Uh, one of the things that I think we don't often have a good feedback loop on, uh, aren't looking for understanding and feedback on, is the, the health of our architecture, the health of our software. And this doesn't have to be a complex problem, right? This doesn't have to be something we spend a lot of time and effort on. Um, this is a particularly useful, I think, uh, something that I find valuable, something that I look at on a lot of our projects. And this is the idea of how does our churn, how does the change of our uh, our code base align with the complexity or the, the challenge spots in our code base. And it turns out you can actually get this without too much trouble. 
this is a graph that comes from a product called Code Climate. Uh, you can get this in some other ways. I, I tend to like Code Climate. I think the easiest way for me to describe this is to kind of walk through what we're looking at here on this chart. So uh, along the left-hand side, going up and down uh, from bottom to top, is how complex certain pieces of our, our system are. So each of these dots, I should say, represents probably a file in our source code um, or a, a component in our source code, kind of depending on how you've broken this up. And along the left-hand side, from going from top to bottom, those things that are at the top, those are pretty complex things. Maybe those are long files. Uh, maybe they have a lot of logic going on in them, something along that line. The things at the bottom are less so. They might be pretty simple files, simple code uh, that uh, doesn't require a lot of thought maybe to understand. If you look glanced at it, you could understand what was going on. But the things at the top, they may take a little while to understand because there's a lot going on in them. Along the bottom, going from left to right, we're talking about how often do those things change, right? So the things on the left don't, those files on the left don't change very often. The things on the right, you can see that kind of outlier on the far right-hand side, that file changes a lot. Maybe it changes every day, maybe it changes every couple days, or, or even maybe a couple times a day. So let's, let's walk through this. I like to break this up into quadrants. I think that's pretty common for folks looking at this. So the things in the upper left-hand corner, those are things that are maybe complex, longer files, um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, but they don't change very often, right? They, because they don't change very often, we can make sure that they work really well. And then we don't, we don't touch them anymore. We don't play with them. So they're not going to introduce bugs. Um, this is a place where maybe we write some integration tests. Maybe we do some manual testing early on or every once in a while. Maybe we have some monitoring going on to make sure that these areas of the code base are working really well. Uh, sometimes this is this is core infrastructure or uh, boilerplate code that we've adopted from a framework or something along that line. But because it doesn't change very often, we don't really spend a lot of time worrying about it. Down here in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, we, we don't have any of these on this particular uh, project here, but these are things that change an awful lot, but they're pretty simple, right? They're safe to change, they're easy to understand, we know things are going on, we might have some unit tests around these, uh, but we don't worry too much about these as well. Uh, they're, not, they're not the focus of our effort. The, it looks pretty good, we don't have a whole lot of these to worry about on this project. The danger zone is in the upper right-hand corner. So the upper right-hand corner are things that change an awful lot, and they're also pretty complex. They're big, they have lots of logic in them for whatever reason. Uh, and these are areas that we, we wanna be careful with, right? And these are also areas where we may prioritize making some changes to our architecture, making some adjustments to the way we build. This may be an opportunity to, to build out some new seams into our system or separate some functionality from each other. We probably have some really good tests around this functionality or around this area so that when we do change it, we know that we, we haven't broken anything. Or at least when we do break something, we know about it. We understand what happened. Over the course of our project, there are lots of ways to get, gather feedback having operational insights, doing user experience testing, uh, understanding how people are using the system. There's lots of techniques for that. Architecture insights, value stream uh, metrics. Our tech lead, our teams need to be focused on understanding consciously, spending time thinking about what our feedback loops look like so that we can integrate those back into the way we build software, back into how we plan, uh, the work that we're doing to prepare for planning, and the software that we're build. But if we don't have these feedback loops and we're not spending a little bit of time building those feedback loops and those systems for feedback, we're going to miss things and we're going to make assumptions along the way or we're gonna build blindly, and that's a challenge. Sustainable software comes through thoughtful, continuous planning. We have to be disciplined about this and it takes effort and it takes time. And that's one of the reasons why we have leaders on our team thinking about these things, trying to create new leaders, trying to create a shared understanding so that our whole team can be building and moving in the same direction and talking about things critically together. We need to have this robust build and deployment pipeline that allows us to have a feedback loop for what we're building in the short term and in the long term. Our teams need to have solid engineering practices so that they can build software well, software that's malleable and that can change as the needs of our projects change. And we also have to have incredible communication in order to learn and build consistently, 
build confidently, to feel in control of our process while understanding how things are changing. I'm excited to, if you have any questions, if you have thoughts, I'm sure there are lots of techniques out there that, that we'd love to talk about. I'm happy to uh, explain any more in the, uh, in the Q&A coming up. Thanks.